just a minute. The purpose of this meeting is to conduct the business of the case. Public comment is welcome and equally for the appropriate board, committee, or administrator. Comments will be summarized in the board meetings, which will be available by contact with Mr. McDonald. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and other electronic devices. Ms. Collins, all uh, board members are accounted for either present in the boardroom or on Zoom for this particular meeting. Notices and communications? No notices or communications. 3.1 through 3.4, you're looking at your, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, justice for all. On to uh, tonight's agenda for our board meeting under 3.1 through 3.4. You will see uh, cash activity summary, food services participation. You will see enrollment as well as capital projects fund report. If there are no questions on the communications or 3.1 through 3.4, we will move on to our routine approach. I'm going to backtrack. We, um, we put out notice that we were going to do a Zoom meeting. Obviously, didn't block anybody from coming in. We don't have anybody present with us in the meeting. But we did provide an outlet for participation uh, via the email. email. As of the start of this meeting, we have not received type of citizens' participation, so it'll be done for this evening. Routine approvals 5.1 is the financial report. We'll vote on these in a lump. I'm going to give each member an opportunity if they have any questions or comments related to each of the uh, subject items. 5.1 financial report. Any questions from the board member related to? Hearing none. 5.2 is Jacoby Transportation and Drivers. It's basically, we have three drivers that are mentioned on there for um, as a part of not only our district, but this is all the paper. Uh, any questions on that? Human services or resources recommendations. Again, that's on an attachment. Are there any questions from any board members on that particular item? 5.4 of regular board meeting, March 2nd, 2020. Again, that is a part of an attachment. Are there any questions or could be open for view on the particular board minutes? Having said that, we'll do a roll call vote on the routine approvals. Al. Yes. Al voted yes. yes, yes, yes. Timon. Yes. Kathleen. Yes. Mike. Yes. Amy. Amy Beth? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Tim? Yes. Sylvan? Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Sylvan. Sylvan, I'm sorry, I could not hear you. You're muted, so. Al, if you would not unmute yourself when you mute you, and that would eliminate the feedback. Sylvan, go ahead. Sylvan. 
Can you hear me now? I can, Sylvan. Okay. I was looking. I was looking for your vote on that particular on the routine approvals. Yes. Thank you, Sylvan. Number six, the items for board action. First subject is 6.1 policy 712 school, school security. Question. Penny, hi, it's Kathleen. I have a question. Uh, on policy 712, 6.1, when I click on the document, it says page one of two, but I don't see a page two. Is it really just a one page document or is it a two page document that we're looking at? I'm showing one page. I'm showing one page also, Kathleen. Okay. Yeah, and that particular one page, Kathleen, is the one that's been. Uh, through the board on two separate occasions and now would be up for vote. Yes, and I understand that. My confusion was simply that the document at the bottom of it, it said page one of two. So I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing something on a page two, but it sounds like there's only one page. So I'm good to go. Thank you, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions on 6.1712 safety? I have a motion. So moved. Second. Roll call. Sylvan. Yes. Tim. Yes. Gary. Yes. Amy Beth. Yes. Mike. We didn't come through, Mike. Yes. Kathleen. Yes. Timon. Yes. Al. Al. Thumbs up. Yeah, did you see after the thumbs up, Kenny? Can that suffice? Motion passes. 6.2 the PPA proposal. Questions? I have a motion for 6.2 the PSPA proposal, please. So moved. Second. Roll call. Amy Beth. Yes. Carrie. Yes. Mike. Yes. Al. Al. Well, it thumbs up. We have a yes from Al. Nobody's seen it. Timon. Yes. Sylvan. Nothing there. Sylvan. We have a yes from Sylvan. Tim? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. And I vote yes. 6.3 authorized superintendent. So moved. Second. Question? We'll call. 
call. Kathleen. Yes. Mike. Yes. Carrie. Yes. Tim. Yes. Amy Beth. Yes. Timon. Yep. Al. Al, your audio is not working, but I can we can see you. So uh, your your vote on that. Al votes yes. Sylvan? Yes. And I vote yes. 6.4, Silver Bin. Except uh, 6.4. Second. Question. Hearing no questions, roll call. Tim. Yes. Kathleen. Yes. Mike. Yes. Timon. Yes. Al. Al, will point Al, six point four children have been uh, voted. Yes, we can hear you. What is your vote on that? I was voted. I was voted yes. Carrie. Yes. Andy Beth. Yes. Sylvan. Yes. And I vote yes. Informational line seven point one eight oh five emergency preparedness and and uh, preparedness and emergency. Is he attached or are there any questions about Dr. Parents in the room? Kenny. Yes. Hi, yeah, I might actually I sent Mike just a few hours ago, so I don't expect you to have seen it. I sent you a couple of uh, thoughts on these policies. So um, that being said. Said, let me see if I have any actual questions. I'm trying to pull up this document. Um, okay, so I do have a couple questions, Dr. Perrin. Uh, in the emergency, I hope I've got the right one. The emergency preparedness and response. Is that the one we're talking about, Kenny? We are talking about 7.1 policy number 805, the emergency preparedness and emergency and it might cut off. Yeah, okay, thank you, that's the one. So Dr. Perrin, in the section titled Emergency Planning, there is a statement there, schools, et cetera, made available, et cetera, for planning and exercises. But my question is, it's such a broad statement, so I'm curious to know when. I mean, is it any time that they're requested or is there certain criteria that needs to be met for that? His question uh, requested by who, Kathleen? Well, that's that's where I'm getting confused. So, if we do you have the document in front of you? No, go ahead. Oh, um, all right, I'll pull it up then. So give me a second here. Okay. So the section is emergency planning. Okay, the statement says this. Um, okay, 
It's the last sentence in the emergency planning section. And it simply reads this, schools and school buses or transportation vehicles owned or leased by the district shall be made available to the local, county, and state officials for emergency planning and exercises. And in fact, I mean, if I could share my screen, I can show this to you. So that's where I'm a little bit confused. Is there some criteria of when those would be made available? No, I mean, that would be, um, that's not something that's new to that policy. That wasn't um, anything that was added or deleted that's been in for quite a while. That usually was put in just because during certain um, instances, um, I guess you could call a pandemic, a pandemic an instance, if, uh, you know, the, if you're pulling the community's resources, sometimes school districts own their buses and they can offer them up as a resource. So now I'm even more confused. It's, it isn't red. So red doesn't indicate that it's new language. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see if Wayne's there. Hey, Wayne, are you out there? Do you want me to share my screen? Aaron, I am here, and she is correct. That is new language. Is that from PSBA, Wayne? That's correct. That's a recommendation from PSBA. Okay. Yeah, my bad. It's uh, an addition by PSBA, Kathleen. Would it be um, safe to say that all of the language in red was a recommendation from PSBA? That's probably correct, right, Wayne? That is correct. I have a question. This is Mike. Um, th this language that the Kathleen's referring to, when when was that? When were these policies added? This was the first reading. I don't remember. Did we go over this in our last policy meeting, or is this is there, are these new items? Yeah, these were these were from the last meeting. Um, they would have been on the uh, March sixteenth board meeting that we canceled. Okay. They were first read. These, these are all first readings. Yes. Oh, sorry, I thought it was muted. Uh, click something wrong and I said an expletive. I hope you didn't hear me. Um, so I'm gonna, but I'm gonna go back to that because I am really confused. I believe that is stated later in the policy in a location where it made sense to me, but I don't, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me here. I think that it's just this open-ended statement without any kind of, again, without any kind of, you know, parameters to it or narrative with it. And because that statement is located below, which I'll have to do a search and find it, where there is context and it makes sense, there's no context here. So somebody, an outside person would read this and it really reads as if at any time, any of these agencies can say, we're commandeering your school, we're commandeering your school buses. We know they're not going to do that, but, but I don't believe that it fits here. <laughs> A simple suggestion, Mike. I would look to Mike Dickerson. This is in considering the board as we're structured here tonight. This is a first read, so it's not a vote item. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen has brought up some points that there's been some head nodding that you can see from this side of the fence. So, what my suggestion in terms of moving forward is is that Mike, as policy chair uh, chairman would take into consideration at the policy committee meeting and see if that first read as we go to the second read can't be better articulated or can't be substantially changed that would suit the board's needs moving forward. Mike, would that be appropriate? Absolutely. Yeah, we could do that. Kathleen, yeah. would that be appropriate? Actually, that's great. And Mike, like I said, I actually a couple of hours ago emailed you a list of questions, et cetera, for all of these policies. So thanks. But I, but since we have Jason here and he can answer a couple questions, um, I do have um, a, a question. Something else that confuses me in the continuity of student learning core operations, we removed a word, closed. 
I assume everyone has this in front of them. If not, again, I can share my screen, but in the event of an emergency, local county or state officials may require that schools be, we took out the word closed and we put in the words made available to serve as mass care facilities or to mitigate the spread of infection or illnesses. And again, made available, it, it kind of makes one question, well, does that mean the schools could still be operational but used as mass care facilities? How do we make schools available to mitigate the spread of infection? So I wondered, was there a reason to remove the word closed and change it out with made available? Technically, there's more than one school in our district. Some, some schools only have one facility, but one facility could be uh, not functioning for students and made into uh, a mass care facility. And, and what we refer to as the LEA, the Local Education Association, could still function as a school. Um, so it, it very well may make sense just as it is. To say made available? Yeah, because it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that all schools in the district would be closed. It may mean that, say, one school, one of the facilities that we have within the district that is a, that is a school could be made available. Like, for example, Eisenhower. Mm, okay. So, so the, the policy committee will have another chance to look at this before yeah. coming back here, is that right? Yeah. Okay. That's my, that's my suggestion. Actually, I'm going to move forward with this directly. That my committee would take into account any of the discussion uh, on the policies after the first three, which I believe is going to be normal behavior in the past, and Al, Al could correct me. So mm -hmm. those concerns related to a policy before it gets to a second read can at least be addressed. It may not be amenable to all board members, but obviously we act in the, in the majority, but at least it gives you an opportunity as a board member to discuss any concerns or changes or modifications you want to make to a particular uh, a policy before it gets to the second read. And the second read, if you understand, we're not even voting at that point. We're just moving it forward to board action at the following meeting. So we will have at least a month uh, on this particular uh, informational items before they'll ever come up for vote. And I would, I would ask Mike if he would, through his policy committee, if we move forward, at least look at some of the areas that were addressed by board members, either through email or tonight, to take into account. That's okay. Well, Kenny, you know what then? We'll just, I have so many questions about all of these, so I will just pause asking them and, uh, and the committee can, can take those up. But the agenda does say that we're going to be voting on these at our April 20th meeting, FYI. That's, that would be the second, that would be the second reading if you the first reading. Policy, uh, and they will probably do via Zoom, via Zoom between now and then. So we can make it work. Did you hear, did you hear the response last time? Pardon no. me, Kenny? Did, did you hear Dr. Karen's response? Not very well. There will be a policy committee meeting prior to the second read that will be addressing the concerns related to any informational items that were actually moving through this evening. And they can be addressed prior to the second reading. The second reading, if those issues aren't addressed by a board member, it'd be no different than any other uh, item that comes up before vote. Do have an opportunity to to uh, speak related to uh, any changes or proposed changes that you think should be made. Okay. So just for clarity, the, the second reading is also the same day as the approval, and that's April twentieth. Correct. Right, so there's this meeting, which is a first read, second reading, which is the approval, and between those two things is a policy committee meeting. So, so, so can we have the meeting corrected? There will be a policy meeting for our second read, it would be up for vote. Mike, Mike will have the ability as, as meeting the chairman, he does, does not feel that that, that policy has substantially been vetted. He can remove that from the agenda and push the second read of that policy, which then, if it's substantially changed, would change it to a first read. So it would go clean back to the first read. But I'm gonna leave that to Mike as committee chairman to make the final determination with the input of the board members whether or not it even goes to second read. All right, that sounds great, thank you. Do we, do we have a date and a format for the policy meeting? Yeah, that'll, get, that'll get sent out to them. I'll be, it might be. 
I would like, I'd like Mike and, and Dr. Parent to have an opportunity to discuss the mechanics of they're gonna, how they're going to conduct a policy meeting. And I don't think that's happened yet, but certainly there'll be advance notice of any committee meeting. The same with Carrie's if she chooses anything pressing under building and finance, et cetera. We'll have an opportunity to get an email out to the, everybody and a public notice. So within the next few days, I would suggest, I would assume that we would have that date. Mike, does that suit on, on the policy part of this? Yes, that's fine. Area, is that acceptable on the building and finance? Thanks. Okay, moving forward, 7.2, first read on number 805.1, relations with the uh, law enforcement agencies. I certainly will entertain questions. I mean, if you have a question now, I don't want to stop that. But uh, now would be the time, if you have a question, at least say you have a question, and Mike, it'll be put on his radar on the policy committee meeting and any any questions can go to both Mike and Dr. Perrin to get that on the agenda at the policy meeting. Hearing none, 7.3 policy 805.2, school security personnel. Seven point four policy number nine one six volunteers. 7.5 effective school solutions and information. Next presentation. It is. Ah, uh, Kelly, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, you are at the effective school solutions and information. I'll just set this. I'll set this up for Kelly, and then let Kelly share some information. Uh, effective school solutions is a group um, looking as a contracted service uh, for next year, a one year contract. Um, and the uh, cost would be paid for through the special education uh, budget through a uh, combination of federal IDA funds and, uh, and district funds combination of those. Um, it is a contracted service with this group deals specifically with uh, uh, mental health and support and counseling. And I'll let, uh, I'll let Kelly just give a brief overview. There was a document that was in your executive content, but Kelly's just going to do a quick summary in terms of uh, what it is, who it supports, and why we're looking at it uh, for middle school. Go ahead, Kelly. Thanks, Dr. Perrin. So we're proposing partnering with Effective School Solutions for next school year to provide mental health services at the middle school. Uh, and these services will be provided to a small cohort of students, 20 students. Uh, the, the mental health service itself consists of a two-person clinical team. These are licensed therapists who will be working in the middle school every day. Uh, they're supported by a uh, clinical supervisor who uh, will work closely with uh, the school district team, including uh, Nancy Herb, the two school counselors, the psychologist, uh, Brandy Glenn Akers, and myself. Uh, and through that, we will um, develop um, a screening process to to get students into this program. And, and the, the main purpose for this is um, we spend a lot of money sending our students outside of the district to receive uh, this kind of specialized service. And um, we found ESS, Effective School Solutions, as a, a potential to bring these students back and have them participate in their homeschool and all of the things that you know are Gettysburg, uh, whereas we currently send uh, approximately 30 students out of the district to receive specialized services, uh, mostly special ed services, but we do um, provide some of these types of services to students who don't have IEPs. Uh, we started this process uh, back in February uh, with a few meetings with this uh, company and doing some virtual visits uh, before Zoom became a part of our everyday world. We were Zooming with um, uh, two school districts in New Jersey to see how they were doing it. So the PowerPoint and the outline um, that we provided, uh, really the focus that um, 
we're, we're asking you to look at is that um, there's clearly a need. Uh, I know that Mrs. Herb can tell you that there's a need at the middle school for services like this that we currently aren't um, providing to our students at the middle school. Uh, by doing uh, this type of uh, service delivery where the clinicians are in our school, uh, they have the ability to meet with students daily. They meet with families. They provide a summer carryover program. They'll provide weekly group therapy. Uh, they'll take kids during the lunch hour, which is often a time of high anxiety for our students who have some mental health issues. Um, and by doing this and providing this in the middle school, it frees up some time that we're currently using on these students to meet the needs of some of our students whose mental health needs aren't that significant. Um, and the guidance counselor can meet with those students. We spend a lot of time serving students with intense needs, both inside and out of the middle school. Uh, and uh, these providers are going to en enable us to meet these needs of these students uh, in a different way and in probably a much more thorough and effective way than we, than we currently do. I just draw your attention to slides 11, 12, and 13, uh, which kind of uh, uh, graphically explains um, what the services are and, um, and, and, and why we're proposing this contract. Thanks, Kelly. And one of the reasons that we're looking at uh, middle school, as Kelly stated, is that uh, certainly we have um, those needs get really significant as you move kind of six through 12. And the hope is if we're able to support some of those students in their younger ages, that will mitigate some of the, uh, the issues that we then see uh, at the high school. So that's why middle school versus uh, starting at, at high school when um, you know, some of those issues have become uh, almost, you know, too significant to reel in um, at certain points. So trying to be able to support those students at a younger age, give them the coping skills that they need, the ability to balance their needs with uh, the uh, instructional, instructional expectations of our programming uh, will, uh, will help the kids become uh, more successful. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, you're welcome. Kelly, so if I may ask, um, Often the students who go to either a, uh, a private facility uh, because of uh, behavior or emotional needs or whether it's um, another entity that's um, more in the public school realm, mm -hmm. um, often they have extra um, uh, support as a person who, who are with them all day long. Are you anticipating that there's someone who's actually with the student as they move through their regular um, schedule or that it's it's more of a come come here during this time for your lunch and we'll you know gather together or you know we'll add a layer of um, of uh, perhaps a, a therapy session or or whatnot could you could you just yep. a little bit more sure the the model that we're looking ESS offers two different models the model we're looking at is the tier three clinical wraparound supports uh, where we are providing the supports to those students in a clinical setting in, in two different rooms at the middle school where the students come to that area for that support. Uh, if a student um, is at a current placement and they have a one-to-one -one person assigned to them, that person's job would still carry over into this new setting. However, the students that we're looking at, because we already have a targeted list of students that we would love to serve, um, these aren't students who would necessarily require one-to-one -to, -one to support. However, they may require still some continued special education supports in a smaller special ed classroom. Um, and then obviously there are other students who are currently in our middle school right now with, with or without special education services who get through their day kind of just by hanging out in the guidance office because they're really struggling. And so this would be, um, this would be a new place for them to not just hang out, but to actually delve in and work on these supports. The cohort of students that would be served is only 20 at a time. It's 10 per clinician. And as soon as the student meets their need, their, or their needs have been met and they're doing better, um, they can come out of the program and a new student can come in. So it's not maybe the same 20 students all year, 
but probably the same 15 all year, maybe five seats can um, transition to support uh, students as they uh, improve and get better. Does that help to answer? It sure does. And I was trying to look for the slides also. I'll go back and find them. Okay. Uh, so I could refer to it. You said the numbers were something like 13. The, the, each clinician can serve 10 students at a time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it will serve, this program will serve 20 students at one time in one cohort. Some of those students are already attending the middle school. Some of these students are attending other placements and we'll be able to bring them back because we will now have a support layer that doesn't currently exist. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Other questions? And if there are questions after the meeting, if you email Kelly and I together, whatever questions you have, then uh, you know one of us will get back, back to you, certainly. Kelly, uh, it's Kathleen. Um, thank you for this. Thank you. Uh, this. You're welcome. I am curious, though, on slide nine, uh, the first bullet point tells us that mental health incidents and severity rates have risen in our district. Do you have more data on that for us? Um, I have, yes, we do. Um, I, can, I can tell you that as administrators, when we met last summer in our summer retreat and we identified um, you know, areas of concern and things that we needed to work on, mental health concerns uh, was clearly at the top. Uh, we have um, fantastic counselors who are school counselors. Uh, some of them could be licensed clinicians because they hold that certification, but as a school counselor, that's not their role. Uh, and the mental health incidence rates um, are measured by the amount of um, student contacts with uh, their guidance counselors for things other than career counseling and maybe typical peer relations, but for mental health um, issues. Uh, one guidance counselor during the first semester at the high school had 15 crisis intervention calls for suicidality. That was one counselor in one semester. Um, so that's just a snapshot of the type of data that we have collected. Uh, and uh, many of these students receive some outpatient counseling um, and some just don't because their parents' insurance aren't accepted. And, um, you know, schools have become the place where kids get uh, more than, you know, they get what they need. And, and what the one thing that we can give these students now uh, uh, is uh, a more intense offering so that we don't have to resort to outside placements. And just to answer a question that's probably going to be coming, outside placements for us average $33,000 a year for these students. Uh, and you know that, that's $125 a day to $158 a day to some of these placements where our kids are going. And, um, and we can do these, we can serve these 20 students for under $15,000 by keeping them back in the district and providing this. One of the key things you also said Kelly, is about the other opportunities that are available in the district that are not available at the yes. other facilities. I mean, uh, you even could just uh, look at um, like the choices for, uh, not electives, um, uh, the special classes, music and, and instrumental yes. music or whatever else may, might be available. They're mm -hmm. not offered in those other facilities. Correct. And I think, uh, Kathleen, to answer your question also, uh, the PA Youth Survey data um, for pretty much district statewide along with Gettysburg, um, the mental health piece is, has been emerging and increasing kind of statewide. So Gettysburg is kind of a microcosm of what we're seeing kind of across the state. But uh, the PA Youth Survey data that we, we take every couple of years uh, bears that out as well. Are there any additional questions on 7.5? Okay, 7.6, 2020-2021 preliminary budget information. Can you open the slides up for everybody to see? Let me actually go here to it. 
Right, the slides for the budget specifically, uh, just remember this is preliminary information. Uh, this will change as the semester um, moves along as we get closer to May and June. Um, just wanted to kind of give a snapshot of where some of these things um, were located. So I'm gonna go through the slides pretty quickly. Um, and then if there are questions at the end, you can either um, you know, email me or, uh, or just ask them. Um, next slide, Andrew. So obviously the budget supports our mission and vision. Next slide, Andrew. Those are our four goal areas that have been in place uh, since I arrived in the district. Um, we have modified them since I've been here, but these are kind of the, still the core areas that we look at. They also support these goals. Um, certainly, our goals for the budget process are as you see them uh, there. Any type of action by the board with regards to budget will be preceded by a recommendation from me. Um, and that'll be true for both preliminary and final budget. So just a couple of data points and how they change over time. So for next year, for 2021, um, as, you're, as you're aware, we, uh, we have a, um, a funding uh, plan for the large purchase, um, our high school HVAC program. And next year is basically where the max kicks in to where we're at 1.5 million, putting that aside for that project. Um, so there's an increase for 2021 there. Next slide, please. Healthcare uh, has been uh, somewhat consistent over the past couple of years. Um, a little bit of an increase for 2021. HSA contributions will go up. Um, I think in January of 21, uh, we'll be putting a little bit more money back in there based on the early bird contract that we uh, uh, signed with the, uh, the teachers. We keep track of attrition. Um, and we calculate attritional savings. Uh, so far, as of April 6th, we have uh, four retirements. We'll continue to table those. Um, and calculate the savings um, from the budget as those positions. And basically attrition is just um, somebody, somebody making a lot of money leaving and being replaced by somebody making less money and there's some savings when that occurs. So we do keep track of that each year. Next slide. Charter school tuition, a um, little bit of an increase, but obviously the three year increase from where we were is a you know half a million dollars uh, and it's why we we try to be as competitive as we can when students are choosing the schools that they're choosing next in special education co costs uh, our budget heads are still working with Belinda going through their budgets we continue to look for um, ways that we can streamline things so these are all data points as of April 6th next and that's just a table that reviews the last like eight slides. So you can move on one more, Andrew. So the way that the way that I have list, listed so far, all these numbers are as if we didn't do anything. Like we didn't add anything else and we didn't have a tax increase. So with a 0% tax increase and adding nothing new, that's what all of these numbers represent. Um, we would project a total revenue increase of about 2.5%. You can see where it comes from local, state. Um, don't get real excited about the federal revenue um, increase of 20%. If you go from a million to 1.2 million, that's a 20% increase. Um, so the federal is the smallest portion of our budget. That's why the increase seems so significant. Next slide. As you know, most of our budget is made up of local revenue, followed by state and then federal. Next slide. So far, as of April 6th, expenditure increases are about 3.2%.
That assumes increased expenditures for contracts and agreements. It assumes the other increases that were in the previous slides. And it continues uh, support of our five-year tech plan. The only change is that initially we were looking to add an additional instructional coach in 2021. We're not going to do that this year. So the cost for the five-year tech plan would stay flat. So there's no increased cost for the five-year tech plan uh, for 2021 as we're currently looking at it. Uh, next. That's how the expenses break down as of April 6th. So fund balance, I'll just draw your attention down to 7.82% that you see kind of midway down through the slide. So basically, if, uh, if we had a 0% tax increase, didn't add anything and nothing else changed, which we know it will, um, we have 7.82% uh, fund balance um, remaining um, after the budget. Remember last year, we used $3.6 million to balance the budget. Um, with a 0% tax increase, we'd be using 4.2. Um, so going a little bit in the wrong direction uh, there, the gap between re revenues and expenditures would, in would increase. Next thing. Couple transportation slides. This is just data based on uh, key elements of transportation. Obviously, uh, we're paying for a significant amount of kids moving around the district on a daily basis. Next slide. Buses, vans, transporting as far away as Harrisburg for the homeless students. Next slide. That's the distance we travel per day. If you line up all the bus runs. Next slide. These are the special budget requests that we've received to date. Um, those are not, those have not been put into the budget with a recommendation at this point. This is just as we've received them. Um, so one is a behavior um, analyst uh, that works with teachers and principals to create behavior plans uh, for students district wide. The second one is uh, Gettysburg Borough contacted us about possibly doing a second school resource officer. The um, the cost for the SRO would be a maximum of eighty seven thousand, and a dean of students at the high school would be fifty three thousand um, net costs because we would be recouping a little bit of the cost of Sean Ecken Road um, moving completely to the uh, Adams County Technical Institute. So the total requests are 229,000. Um, none of those have been put into the budget. We're still looking at those in terms of, um, you know, kind of creating priorities. So uh, at the next board meeting on April 20th, um, I'll share a couple of narratives um, from those with specific details about each one of those requests. Next slide, Andrew. So those are just some of the goals, you know, as we, as we uh, move towards a final budget. Next slide. That's just where we've been tax wise. Um, 1819 was my first year here. We did a 0.86% and last year we did a 1.00%. Next slide, Andrew. And that's just a map of possible dates for um, board information and board action. As Kenny mentioned in one of the previous meetings, um, in between those we can have whatever work sessions or other information sessions, um, you know, that we need. Um, but basically every couple of weeks things become uh, clearer and clearer. What's going to be interesting is um, how some of the revenues act given what we're dealing with with all of the uh you know the virus shutdowns um you know how's that obviously going to impact district investments how's that going to affect um earned income 
uh, tax, how's that going to affect, uh, you know, a lot of different variables that affects uh, revenue kind of on our, on our side of the, uh, on our side of the fence. So we'll continue to update all the numbers and I'll share, basically I'll reshare these slides and just keep updating the numbers to show how that changes as some of the unknowns become knowns um, as we move through the budget process. So just preliminary, but that's some information that we have as of, uh, as of right now. Are there, are there any uh, jump out questions from the board members this evening for Dr. Perrin on the, on the short presentation you got? I'm actually at another date as we move forward, especially given the board structure. And this is the first time we've gone through a budget process together as a unit and see where the best recommendation for budget workshops should be prior to sitting down in a board meeting where we have other business. It'll allow the board members, and it's always but it'll allow the board members to have a clear focus on the budget and items that they have specific questions. And it'll allow the fellow board members to hear the rationale as we move through the budget process. And we're not gonna wait to be my recommendation to the very end or as we get close to ratification of the budget. So please uh, check your email here in the very near future on the suggested um, budget workshops or dates for that. And I'll work with Dr. Perrin to see what's suitable. And uh, similar to what we do with our committees, we can do the same type of structure on a budget workshop. So everybody's comfortable as, uh, as we come closer to our ratification. Does that sound okay? Any questions on that? Kenny, hi, Kathleen. Do you foresee a budget workshop happening between that April 20th board meeting and the May 4th board meeting? Between April 20th and May 4th might make sense. And then um, or between uh, May 4th and uh, June 1st. So, you know, be before the preliminary, but um, more importantly, because the preliminary, um, is exactly that it's a preliminary uh it's a preliminary budget the uh the may 4th preliminary budget vote that always changes so it's probably more important that we have a more extended kind of uh workshop between like may 4th and june 1st because then we're moving from preliminary budget to actual budget and the numbers become uh a little bit easier to predict because they're a little bit more accurate. So that way we're not spending a lot of time at the end of, April, end of April on numbers that are still preliminary. We can spend more time once the numbers become a little bit more exact. And, and Kathleen, I'll just follow up and, and I know you've been through the budget process, but I would agree with Jason and I obviously didn't have this conversation before I came in. I'd like to see the numbers become a little bit more concrete because what we might discuss in a budget workshop could all be changed if the projected numbers change on expenditure or on revenue coming in. So I would look for that meeting to be before the, uh, after the May 4th meeting. Is that correct? Yeah, we could do two or we could do one after the May 4th. Well, I'm gonna leave the one or two. We're definitely gonna do one. I'll leave the second one up to the board and you know, we leave that workshop. But my suggestion is what I'm gonna do personally, there are several items we can link in what budget presentation that I have follow-up questions with, but I'm going to email them off on Dr. Perrin uh, personally just to, just to satisfy myself. And I would recommend any of the board members to so at least we can sit down at a workshop that maybe you can get some of the answers from him without inundating him, you know, before, uh, before we even go to those preliminary questions. Yeah, I would suggest any, uh, any emails with budget questions, if you send them send to me, Copy the full board because somebody else might learn something from the response to your question. Jason, something that would have been really helpful for me um, in, in my first budget go around would have been um, a budget workshop that really had nothing to do with numbers, but was kind of, you know, school budgets 101. You know, we talk about reducing a structural deficit, 
and other things that for me personally, those were all pretty foreign concepts. I mean, I know how to create and manage a budget for a for-profit organization and certainly for my family, my household as well, but school budgets are so different. So I'll leave it up really to the group, but um, I think it could be helpful to have just a kind of a school budget 101 workshop. Again, not even pertaining to the figures themselves. Well, well looking, at, looking at the calendar now, and if we're looking at, at our next board meeting being May 4th, then allowing um, the department heads and Dr. Perrin to um, try to get their ducks in line, so to speak, we would look at probably the last week of April, that week of the 27th through the 30th, which would then give us an opportunity to have a budget workshop to whatever degree we need going into the preliminary vote on May 4th, knowing the preliminary vote is not a final vote, and that allows us to have another workshop after that, and hopefully, you know, some of the decisions, like when you go through that workshop, and you know as well as I do, Kathleen, some of our decisions based upon, you know, the structural deficit and what we feel is necessary with our, with our, uh, with a tax, whatever, if there is a recommended tax increase, how much we're going into our unassigned fund balance. So there, I'm with you. There's a whole host of questions that we have. So I'm not opposed. And, and, and truthfully, it does, it's not a mandatory meeting if you want to have a workshop it's for no different than the committees and I probably will look to see as long as it, it, it's okay with it, it's structurally okay that last week of April of doing a workshop followed by our May 4th budget meeting or May 4th board meeting which would include a portion of the budget I'm not hearing any objection to that so I'll send that out I'll work with Dr. Perrin to get a particular date the last week of April, and we'll do a budget workshop. Uh, and we'll set a time and I'll get it out in, the, in an email to all the board members and, and put the notice out to the public. Are there any questions specifically to the, the, the brief budget information Dr. Perrin provided this evening? If not, I'm gonna move on to our next I have a question. Yes, Tim. And uh, do we have any lookout to see if the virus is going to affect any of this kind of stuff? Which particular, which particular, uh, I mean, is the virus going to have any effect on the budget at all? Well, yeah, definitely. As, I, as I mentioned, it, it could have significant effects on the revenue side on things like current income, um, have, you know, effects on, um, you know, just about any of the variables that we don't, Control. I'm only getting about every other word. Uh, no effects there. Um, you could have effects on what the state decides to allocate to districts next year. You could have changes to what the federal government decides to allocate to stuff um, next year. We only really control one of all of those variables, and that's and that's the tax increase. Um, okay. So, you know, we have to kind of watch. The landscape, especially with with revenues, and see what's happening with those, so that we don't exacerbate it by doing something with the only variable that we control. Okay, I just want to make sure we were taking that into consideration. Thank you. Um, also, along the lines of tax revenues, um, with uh, I know like the federal income tax is uh, they changed the date for uh, submission for that till later. Um, I know that the, the state of Pennsylvania is expecting revenues to be down, but again, we're tied to property tax. Um, so there, there may also be some pieces in play there if taxes are deferred for property taxes or whatnot, um, that could certainly play into a, a budget as well as, as people not being able to pay their taxes. Right, even things like collection rates. Um, all of those different kind of things could be impacted. So we'll keep an eye on those. And, and just to add, Carrie, to that, I, I'm in total agreement with you. And that was one of the things that, as we went through the budget in the past years, is concerning to me now, as we go into a proposed budget, it, it really is a proposed budget because uh, we don't know what we're going to be collecting or what rate we're going to collect or when we're going to collect any of the earned income tax, the real estate tax, et cetera, et cetera, even from, you know, we don't know how long the businesses are shut down. And at the end of the day, while the district is financially secure, it may change, you know, a decision on what we do on any increase, if we do an increase or how much we're going into our unassigned fund balance 
and lowering that and, and, and tighten our belt down the road because of the, you know, the economic hardship that people are facing right now. I, I agree with you. It's a, it, this, is a, this is a chess match, I think, with this budget right now. Go ahead, Al. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if the state, uh, with the governor's office and PDE, uh, are they looking at possibly moving our deadlines for approving a preliminary and final budget back uh, a month or two? Uh, uh, I just wondered if there was any discussion on that. With so many things up in the air right now, it would seem that it would be like a prudent move to, to make. No, it would be, I mean, it would be helpful, but I think that, you know, just given, given the history, uh, there's really never, ever been movement on the deadline for school districts to do their budgets. Um, only the state can be late. So far, we haven't seen that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's been nothing, nothing posted. Is there additional on that particular item okay board committee reports there is not a uh, finance and facilities report at this time and Terry, uh, I can we can how you can use that next building and finance we actually completely have it facilitate on how you want to do that you know, so that they meet all the standards you know the public can talk to us Andrew would be more willing to help if, if you feel the need of doing one before the next board meeting. Yes, there is no power parts at this time. Okay. Thank you. And the same as what I was saying to Carrie, if you want to discuss with Andrew on facilitating the next policy meeting, he'll certainly set up the logistics on how we're going to make sure that the public uh, may not have physical access, but has at least we're abiding by the uh, sunshine law. Thank you. Nope, I'll hit, I'll hit everything else in the executive session. Number nine. Reports. I'll hold mine for executive session. Okay, calendar of events. Our next school board meeting is April 20th. In between that, obviously, the we information sent out about the board committee reports. If we have one, I wanted to make a note that I didn't say at the beginning of the meeting. On March 16th, we had an executive session. In, I'm sorry, executive session in lieu of the board meeting. It dealt strictly with safety. Uh, and tonight, immediately following our board meeting, will be the executive session, and that'll be related to negotiations. Are there any questions on that? Carrie? Um, is that on that? I was waiting for the questions for the good of the order. So if we're there, then. Getting it right now. So for good of the order, before I uh, we do an adjournment, go ahead, Kate. So the question I have, uh, and Jason, I apologize that, uh, if you don't have information on this yet. Um, we certainly know that the teachers are working and your administrative staff is working and they are going to get paid. Can you talk a little bit about what's going to happen with like say custodial staff or um, perhaps cafeteria, the cafeteria staff are working, but you know, um, those and the other question I have is what about um, bus contracts? What's um, happening with that uh, as the buses are not running? The uh... Well, Act, uh, Act 13 kind of covers most of our employees. So when the law was passed, um, which became Act 13, um, all of our employees, basically you can't pay them less or more than they would have gotten if we went through a, went through a normal uh, school year. So really the only things that we've been looking at have been um, some, of those some of those contracted uh, services. Um, so as we, as we negotiate things like MOUs and those types of things, um, I would share those, uh, both in executive session and, um, and with the board of appropriate. So 
So uh, like for MOUs, there might be one between- um, Like some, like between the district and say the bus contractors. Exactly, yeah. thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. I think it's important sure. to, be, to address, thank you. Anything else? Just a reminder, I know exactly what we're going to have a discussion all along. We're working to have a So moved. Second. We're adjourned. Okay, uh, so admin team can jump off and board members uh, and TAM stay. Thanks.